You got everything? Phone, wallet, passport? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I got everything. You know she finna start crying, right? <laughs> <laughs> Be quiet, Arbor. Listen, sweetie, make sure you call us when you get there. You know I'm gonna worry about you. All right, yeah, I will. Um, my flight gets in around 8.30, but, you know, I got to get some Wi-Fi first. But when I get some Wi-Fi, I'll, I'll let y'all know. All right, man, well, you know what to do. Handle your business. As always, we're real proud of you, baby boy. All right, appreciate it. Love y'all. Love, Love you, you too. too. Welcome back to another episode of Life Across the Waters. I'm your host, Andrew Perry, AKA Mr. Certified in Person. Uh, We're here at Home Turf at at Carpena, um, you know, home of the 2023 uh, Copa del Rey champions, Unicaja Balancesto. Um, We'll we'll get into that a little later. But, uh, you know, my my first guest on this second season is none other than uh, the man himself, you know, Stark Vegas finest, um, three year, a professional basketball player in his third year now overseas, um, Tyson Carter. Appreciate you joining me, my boy. Glad to be here, bro. Appreciate it, appreciate it. So before we really get into it, um, you know, like I mentioned, growing up in in, in Starkville, Mississippi, um, kind of small town USA, for those that aren't familiar, um, what was it like kind of kind of growing up in, in Starkville and just where did, uh, you know, where did you, find the roots to kind of start playing basketball? Um, well, growing up in Starkville, it's a small town, mm-hmm. but a college town. So Mississippi State is right there. And um, since it's a small town, there's not much to do, but play sports for real with your friends growing up. That's all we did. That's all the memories, early memories I can remember is just playing with my friends and um, playing different sports, whatever we could do. And um, so that's that's pretty much how I was growing up and um how I found my love for the game of basketball. Um my dad was a coach, obviously. He coached me in high school and he played basketball um at Mississippi State and also professionally. And so I was always around the game. We had basketball all around the house growing up. I was always watching it on TV with him and stuff like that. So uh that's pretty much how I got my love. Okay. All right. You uh, you mentioned your 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 pops, uh, you know, coaching you and 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 playing. Um, uh, he 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 was a former player at at Mississippi State. Um, average for a career, average ten points, five and a half rebounds, two assists. Uh, Mississippi State Sports Hall of Fame in twenty sixteen. Um, so obviously, you know, he's got quite a bit of a resume. Um, you know, before we really talk about your college path, what was it like, kind of? you know, growing up and seeing your dad, maybe not even really noticing what was going on at the time, but just kind of growing up and, and having a father who was very successful in sports to the point where, you know, he even played professionally himself. Uh, what was that kind of like for you seeing that growing up? Well, um, like you said, I didn't really know no better. That's, that's the, um, the only man that was around because he was my dad. So I just thought it was normal, I guess. I didn't really know. And that's just, that's kind of how I like, fell in love with the game because I was around it so much. Uh, I remember I used to be three, four years old and just at his practices, you know. As a kid, you got a short attention span, you want to run around everywhere, but um, I actually enjoy going to his practices and just watching and being around the game since a young age. And um, like I said, get back to just growing up in Starkville, we played all sports growing up, like football, baseball, whatever. And, and we loved it, but Basketball was always that that one, you know? Basketball was always that one. And even when I would get good at other sports, really good, and people would tell me about a future or anything, I was like, yeah, I'm sticking to basketball. That's kind of what I want to do. And I think that came from him for sure. Okay, all right. So uh, you, you followed in your father's footsteps, um, playing for Mississippi State all four years. Um, you know, just a few quick highlights of your of your career there. You. Um, or a thousand point score with thirteen hundred fifty two points uh, for your career. Uh, you and your dad were the only father son duo to both score over a thousand points in SEC history. Did you know that before beforehand? Um, not before it happened that we that no other father son duo, but um, they identified. But afterwards, after, after yeah, the fact, sure. yeah. 
Um, so before we really get into, you know, your your um, development through through college, you know, going to Mississippi State behind your father, was there ever that thought in your mind with like, damn, I got some big shoes to fill. You know, I got to, you know, my dad kind of left his own legacy there and I got to kind of, you know, do what I can to have a, a career that's just as good, if not better than than my father. You know, were there, was, were there any thoughts like that going through your mind? Uh, not really. I never really, um, never really put too much pressure on it in the fact that he played um, and he never would let me do that either. If I, I never really brought it to him though. It was never a conversation that we had. Um, no, not even no friendly competition or nothing like that. I would just always go to him for advice and stuff like that. Uh, I never really compared myself to him. We were we played different positions. He was more like a three four, and I'm more like a two one kind of. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just always different. And other than you know people coming up telling me stories about my dad, and um, they actually have a picture of him in our practice gym with with a lot of the other great players that played at Mississippi State. And um, just seeing that, it would kind of it would be it would be, it would be motivation. For sure, that was motivation. When you got the news about the about the father son, the first father son duo, uh, the score one K, what was that like? Was there a conversation there with with you and your pops then? Uh, nah, not really. We we kind of got a conversation about uh, kind of being happy that we did that. Like like we actually were nice in college or something, you know, maybe something like that. Uh, but I end up I end up passing him in the scoring. I was that was going to be my next question. Yeah, <laughs> that was going to be my next question. We both scored a thousand, but I passed him one game at a home game, and he was there. And um, yeah, I remember we had a timeout after I scored, and he was there, and they they shouted it over the um, over the speaker, the crowd, and everybody was cheering. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, for sure. He, I'm I'm sure he had that that proud dad moment. Yeah, for that sure, was crazy. For sure. Um, so, you know, like you said, obviously you had some good success, some good individual success at, at uh, Mississippi State as well. Um, I kind of want to talk about your senior year because um, it wasn't the typical senior year. You know, that was the that was the senior year where where COVID had just had just started, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so. I know you, we've we've had stories, you told you told me this story off camera plenty of times, but for those that don't know, just kind of paint that picture for for what it was like um you know just you know having a having a normal season you know you you're you're thinking as a senior right so you know you want to leave it all out there and then whatever happens happens maybe get a you know maybe make a run in the ncaa tournament and try to get some uh pre-draft workouts sneak on a draft board but you know with the pandemic it's like all that kind of just went to shit you know what i mean kind of walk us through what it was like kind of being in the being in the middle of it all. You know, well, you know, the season was normal, like you said. Um, and going into the season, obviously I had high expectations for myself. Um, kind of after the first three years, I knew I felt like I waited my turn and I, I got better and developed. And that was kind of the year for it all, basically. It was for every day because it was my last year. And I worked hard for sure in the off season preparing for that year and was having a successful year. For the most part, uh, we were a really good team. We were we had a chance to make the tournament, finish fourth in the SEC, which was at that time one of the best um, conferences, still is one of the best conferences. So going into the SEC tournament, we was we was going off, off a little winning streak. We were playing good, and we, we felt like we had a chance to make a little run. And um, we started just hearing these rumors about COVID, came to the US and people were getting sick and testing positive and people were dying and stuff. And um, going to a shoot around the day before a game at the SEC tournament, we started reading on Twitter that that they were um, they were just, they were shutting down certain teams' conferences tournament, the conference tournaments. And um, we were on Twitter on the bus refreshing our page and we refreshed the page and ACC, they shut down. Big 12, they shut theirs down. And then we refreshed it one more time, like 10 seconds later, it said SEC. SEC. And I remember they stopped the bus, turned it around, went back to the hotel, and our coach was flying home. It was kind of just disappointing because we just didn't know anything. And by the time I made it back to my place, they said all NCAA sports are suspended indefinitely for, um, for the remainder of spring semester. So kind of like, it was a weird feeling, yeah. like, 
first you're thinking about college, like all oh, this that we put into this season and it just goes to nothing because we can't finish the season. And then you get to think about the future. Well, I don't have, I don't, I'm not on a draft board. I'm not up for no workouts because COVID is shut down. I don't know about summer league. I don't even know where the draft is because they got to finish their season. All right. And it was, it was, it was just a lot going on, a lot going on. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate because you know, like you said, you, like you individually were having a good year. You was averaging fourteen points, three assists, three rebounds. Um, you won six man of the year, correct? Yeah. Uh, first Mississippi State player to do that, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you you're, like I said, you know, you're thinking, okay, we get in the tournament and we get hot. You know how that goes. Everybody's stock kind of goes up a little bit, um, but you know, you don't have that. So now. You know, there's no there's no summer league, there's no pre-draft workouts. Everything is just like up in the air, right? What's the mindset now? You know your college season is is or your college career is is finished on something that's uncontrollable and now it's just like what's what's next? You know, I, I opt, of course optimism sets in. Of course you want to be able to continue to work out, but there's that sense of reality where it's like nothing is happening and we don't know when things are going to happen. So what was it like kind of that first off season, that first real off season after your after your college career? It was just a really weird time just looking back on it. And even now with you explaining it, it's kind of just put me back to 2020 and it's it's just like our dream playing college and growing up in the states, you want to play in the NBA cuz that's the highest level and a lot of our idols and and you know, childhood heroes kind of played in the NBA, you know, so that's where we want to be. And I was trying to work towards that. And after the season, I knew that I, I would have some workouts and, and maybe could work myself up to maybe getting drafted or something. But when the season ended the way it did, is you couldn't do that. There was no workouts. Like I said, it was a lot of unknown because they still had to finish their season from the year before. And not even that. I couldn't even find a gym to get into because, because all the, the gyms were the closed. Virus, all the mm -hmm. gyms were closed. Um, so you just just didn't know anything. I couldn't even get a workout. I couldn't work out or nothing, even if I wanted to. So it was just um, it was just a weird time and and really weird because you didn't know what the future was going to hold. Right. Didn't know what the future. Was going to hold. All right. Well, I mean. Somehow, some way, you know, God works in mysterious ways, right? You end up, you know, signing with an agent and, you know, your first, um, he gets you that first gig. And, you know, I always like to tell people, like, I don't want to say jump at the first gig, but you have to be realistic in terms of, you know, your first opportunities, right? Everywhere is not going to be a Euro League. Everywhere is not going to be this high level Europe. You might have to really grind it out. You know, but it only takes one year. It only takes one. It year. only takes one year. That's all it takes. Um, you find yourself in in Livrio, small town in in Greece, not too far from Athens. Um, you know, first before we get into you know the on the court stuff there, what was your mindset after you signed? And you know, okay, given everything you went through, you know, with COVID and um, the just the the unknown and then now this known comes out of nowhere. I, I got my first opportunity going overseas. What was the mindset like before and what were your first impressions once you kind of settled into to Greece a little bit? Uh, well, after signing with an agent, um, ended up deciding to go to Greece. I looked it up, looked up the city and I saw that it was, was right on the water, close to Athens. Um, the views of the city was nice, and I had never really been, um, I never been to Greece for sure. I never really been nowhere um, that was like close to the water like that, and I thought that was cool. And um, so looking it up, I was I was excited about the opportunity to play professional because I know I didn't have I didn't have much other options. So I was excited at, at that that opportunity for sure. And just getting over there, I didn't really know what to expect with the living or basketball or anything like that. And the people in Lavrio were great. Um, I get good memories thinking about Lavrio and um, just the people that I met there. They're really, really nice people. And um, it's like a tight, almost community village because it's so small. So uh, most people know everybody and most people come to the games and mm -hmm. are fans of the basketball team. And um, 
just getting there, it was just, it was a lot different than what I was used to in Mississippi. Um, I struggled with the food and, and, and stuff like that because it's not used, it's not really the food that I'm used to. And, and so I, I had to get acclimated to that. And um, just living, getting around, um, communicating with the language barrier mm -hmm. is really hard to communicate because I don't speak, I only speak English and not many people can speak English, you know, so it's hard to communicate sometimes. And, and yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely a change for sure. Yeah. It was definitely a change. Yeah. Cause you know, Greece is one of those places too. It's like the lettering is even yeah. different too. So like, you can't even try to like really type in anything in the trans in like the translator app. You really got to like scan everything yeah, on your tough. phone. You got to scan everything. And you know, it's, it's tedious, but it's, even at the even as something simple as going to the grocery store, right, right. You know, it takes forever to get what you want at the grocery store because you don't know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. They might not have what you're used to mm -hmm. back home, or something you think is turkey might be ham. You know, got to yeah, yeah. got to got to have that translator yeah, handy for, for real. Make sure you're on that Wi-Fi too, huh? Yeah, got to have the <laughs> Wi-Fi, and that's 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 a big thing for real because right. we used to have in our phone twenty four seven. I need my phone and. Um, just leaving out of my place, just driving, stuff like that. I need the maps. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. But you don't have no Wi-Fi. Right. It's just, it was a lot. Yeah, it's a lot, to, it's a lot to maneuver, especially for first year out, you know what I'm saying, being away from family um, and everything. But um, on the court, you know, hoop is hoop. You know, we always say that no matter where in the world, um, basketball is still basketball. And, you know, you show good signs your first year, averaging 14, 3-3. Three and three. Um, you led Lavrio to the finals in the Greek League for the first time in their club's history. Um, ended up losing the Panathinaikos, which obviously, you know, for everyone that understands overseas basketball, Panathinaikos is a powerhouse, um, a, a historic powerhouse in, in not just the Greek League, but, you know, in all of Europe. Um, kind of talk about what that experience was like, just, you know, being first year out, kind of just new to everything and then you you see some you see some really good success you know some 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 might say you know overachieving or overachieving season yeah uh in that regard uh kind of talk about what what that was like for you on the court yeah well it was such a struggle off the court that basketball made everything so much easier like basketball was the easy part because um like i said since i stayed home to go to college i had never been away from starkville for that long and moving out of the country by myself, no family, no friends, just everything is new. It was really tough, especially in the midst of a shutdown with, with the COVID situation. All right. So it was, it got real lonely and basketball was really the only thing that I had for sure that I knew that wasn't, that wasn't foreign to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that, like you said, hoop is hoop. And once you get between the lines, it's like, that's all that matters. And I could kind of, I could kind of, take some stress off with, with playing ball. That made everything better. And putting my energy into basketball the way I did, it helped me. It helped me for sure. And I had, luckily I had some great teammates in Greece that um, we all were on the same page and we all had the same goals in mind. And it, it made for a special season for mm -hmm. sure. And the coach at Greece, you know, I always have nothing but good words to say about him because he um, he helped me through that time a lot with just helping me with the European game and just, um, Probably you know, ad adapting as a yeah, whole. Yeah, with adapting yeah. as a whole, mm -hmm. just just let me know ins and outs of, of the European game and stuff like that, that helped a lot. Sure. Talk about, uh, talk about the, like the Greek culture in terms of the food. Mm -hmm. um, I know you say you love, you love the Greek food, you yeah. the, the, how fresh the, the seafood was there. Uh, talk about, you know, kind of the Greek culture um, you spent a lot of time in Athens where yeah. I was, where we played against each other. Yeah. Uh, just talk about, you know, how much you, you enjoyed, uh, you know, the city of, not just Lavrio, but, you know, the surrounding city as well. Well, after getting acclimated and, you know, finding my good restaurants, finding my spots, uh, going to Athens, finding a few, few restaurants and a few places to hang out and chill, it got way easier after that. Um, I actually liked it in, in Greece a lot. And like you said, the food was great. Um, just the vibes as a whole is, is great. It's, it reminds me a lot of Spain with the weather and uh, would it be right right by the water and stuff like that. It reminded me of, of Spain in that aspect because, like I said, it's still something that I'm not used to. 
Yeah, but um, just after getting acclimated and you know meeting meeting the right people and stuff like that, it, it was it was really nice. You enjoyed it because you know the next year you decided to double down, return to Live Rio. Um, before before we get into that uh, season, what was kind of the deciding factors that made you want to go back? Was it, um, you know, you just felt comfortable in the system and the coach? You know, the fact that you guys had success the year uh, before. Um, was it, you know, because you know how this game is, right? A lot of people might see. You know, you're doing well at Lavrio and say, ah, well, it's, you know, it's a lower level team, you know. You know um, we like him, but we're not really sure, you know, um, which which happens very often, right, you know. Right. Um, was it was it kind of a combination of those factors? What were what were kind of those deciding factors that made you want to, you know, spin the block on, on Lavrio? Um, well, the season, the NBA season was, was pushed back um, after – that first year after COVID because it, it pushed everything back. So I still had that on my mind. I, I wasn't really uh, focused on Europe as much because I felt like I never got a shot. I never had NBA workouts. I never been able to uh, kind of showcase my talent in right. front of them outside of college. So right. I wanted to get a chance to do that. And summer league was pushed back to August that year. And if you know anything about Europe, you know, August, if you have a sign by August, and it get in the slim piggins. It get it gets slim, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It gets slim and, and the options de decrease rapidly mm -hmm, for real. Mm -hmm. So uh some of didn't go how I wanted it to. And um I was going back to Europe and didn't really have that many options. But Lario was one of them and I had been there. Uh knew the coach, knew the system, knew the organization, knew everything. And I was comfortable going there, feeling like I could showcase my talents to even higher level, knowing that I had been there a year before. And um, I knew the coach was gonna let me run the show, basically, for real. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's obviously, you know, we talk about a lot about like a sense of familiarity and stability, right? Like that's that's important. You know, I think um, m most players overseas kind of strive for that, you know, just being somewhere where they really enjoy on and off the court to where they can be successful. You know what I'm saying, individually and as a team. Um, what was kind of your mindset? You know, kind of, you know, basing basing after everything you just told me. Um, you know, you you're familiar with the coach. It seems like you're gonna have more of a, you know, more of a role. Um, with that comes more of a, a self confidence and a confidence in the coach has in you. Is it a difference in the mindset you have to have in terms of like, all right, I need to you know, prepare a certain way now because I know that, you know, I'm going to be given more responsibility or is it just kind of one of those like, all right, well, we've had this success last year. You know, we're, we're bringing, you know, good core of guys back. Let's just try to keep, you know, keep building off this thing. Or is it really like a shift where it's like, nah, it's, it's we can really do some damage. And, you know, now that there's a, a sense of familiarity, not for just yourself, but, you know, your teammates and, and coach as well. Well, um, with with a few of the a few of the locals, the um the Greek guys, I was the only American that returned. So, um, it was it was a totally different team, basically a new team for real, with the exception of a few guys. And um, my mindset was just like, we can maybe have a if we have a a year like last year, this year we we moved up to champion that second year, and that was one of, also one of the deciding factors of me going back. And I was like, if we have that season in front of showcased in front of Europe with Champions League, we travel in places, and if I can, me individually could have that type of season, I could get into in front of some other, you know, good organizations, mm -hmm. and you know, move up mm -hmm. over here as 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 we all want to do. You know what I'm saying? So, um, that was my mindset for sure. Like we playing Champions League, I'm about to I'm about to go kill basically. Right, you right. know, you know how that, you know how the mindset is. So. I was just like, you know, we we gonna see what happens for you. But I was excited about it being Champions League. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, you were in a mind state of kill, and you know, you pretty much doing that. Um, to the to added a few points to your to your average coming from the first year. Um, and you know, like you mentioned, playing in playing in Champions League, where for those that don't know, um, you know, that's just a much bigger stage right because now you're just not you're not just playing against teams from greek you're playing against teams from italy spain 
Russia, France, Germany, wherever, uh, on a weekly basis. You yeah. know, so uh, you know, who knows? You have a good game against Unicaja, and you end up here. Exactly. Exactly. You have a good game against, uh, you know, my former team, Nizhny, you hit him up for 35, and then you find yourself in Russia. You know, it just, you never know what doors can open from that. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of, you hit it on the nail with that one. With Champions League, that's just another stage where you were able to kind of showcase uh, your skills. Yeah. Uh, sure. So you, you know, obviously these, these skills come to play now, and uh, midway through the season, your contract gets bought out by Zenit. St. Petersburg, um, EuroLeague team uh, from Russia. Um, before we get into that and that whole dynamic, what was what was kind of your initial thoughts? You got that we got that that call from the agent, that text from the agent saying, "Look, pack bags, <laughs> you know. Get, hopefully, you can find something warm because you go off from sunny Greece to to cold Russia in the middle of winter." <laughs> yeah. So what was that conversation like? Well. I- you know how, you know, we think about Russia before you actually been, you know, you're kind of skeptical. And um, obviously the weather's cold. I've never been nowhere that was cold. You know, I'm from Mississippi and I've been in Greece, so I've never been nowhere that was cold like that. But at the time, and none of that mattered. I was, that was one of the most happiest days, like, that I've had for sure um, since graduating college and over my professional career. That was, that was a happy day for me. Um, getting that call, I remember... I remember my agent hitting me like, I hope you got some warm clothes. Right. <laughs> it was like you going to Russia and stuff. So that was that was great for real. That was that was one of the best days I had over here. I wasn't even thinking about how different it would be going to Russia. And um uh-huh. I didn't think much of it. I was just I was really happy for that opportunity being Europe. And that being the level that you know a lot of a lot of players in Europe want to get to. Before we talk about your league, what was that conversation with Mount Dukes like? When you got that, when you got a call and be like, hey, Ma, I know I was in Greece, but I'm about to go to Russia. Yeah. And again, like you said, like, you know, obviously knowing what we know now and experience Russia, we have a different perspective. But, you know, for the average American, you know, sees Russia portrayed a certain way on TV right. or in the media. What was that conversation like for your mom or your dad or who or your friends or whoever? That was just like when they hear Russia, it's like, you know, a, a, an immediate red flag. Yeah, my mom and, and like my aunties, my grandma, they they was... They was on edge about it, like in Russia. I don't know about Russia and uh, stuff like that. With what we hear about Russia growing up, like you said, and they was definitely kind of nervous about me going, but I showed them where I was going, St. Petersburg. And when they would look up pictures, they always say how beautiful it looked there and that it looked nice. And when I got there, I thought the same thing. I was just just blown away about how beautiful it was, despite it just being white, snow everywhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a really, it was a really nice city. It was a nice city, and it didn't take them long to kind of start feeling better about where I was at until, obviously, the war happened. Yeah, I mean, because initially, you know, it's it's that shock, but then I think once kind of the dust settles and they see, like, all right, you know, my son or my my nephew or whoever isn't in real danger, then I think it kind of calms down. At least that's how it was for, for me and my people, so. You talked about, you know, obviously now you're on the biggest stage of Europe, right, with EuroLeague. You talked about one international stage with champion, but EuroLeague is just, you know, it's the, it's the top of the top. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? What was it? What was, what was you know, what was kind of going through your head where you're like, you're you're looking up and now these teams that you might have seen on TV, you know, Efes, Milan, Fenerbahce, Olympiacos, you know, these, these historic top-notch teams that everybody talks about in Europe, now you're playing against them. And now it's like, a reality. What was what was that like for you? The and it only being your second year playing professional. Um, at the time, I was I was really confident. I was I was coming off of, of um, doing really good at Lavrio that second year, so I was I was pretty confident, and I felt like I was ready to take that step. Um, I feel like if a, if a Euroleague team, if I'm good enough for a Euroleague team to call me and want me to buy me and want to buy me out, then I feel like I'm good enough to play on this level, you know. So. Uh, I just knew that, you know, I had to practice and get acclimated with a new system mid-season, you know what I'm saying, and kind of um, kind of navigate my way through that because I also was playing point guard after playing all uh, shooting guard in Greece. So I knew it was some things I had to get acclimated to for sure, but I was ready to, I was ready to take that step. I, I was really excited about playing EuroLeague. Like I was really excited about playing EuroLeague, just watching 
watching some of the guys over here, you know, um, coming from college, we're not going to know but a few guys, but they're going to be Euro League. We're going to know Mike James and Shane Larkin and guys like that that just end up playing the same league with those guys. Like, you know, that's really exciting. All right. All right. Um, you know, when we when we talk off camera about, you know, the 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 your times in, in Zenit, you you often mention a lot, you know, your former teammates. Um uh, you know, Jordan Lloyd, Billy Barron, Alex Poitras, Jordan Mickey, um, Shabazz Napier. Um, and not just the Americans too, right? You you really were close with the domestic guys as well. Um and you still you still very you talk very highly of, of all of them. What was it something that, you know, they kind of took you under their wing? Was it, you know, just the, the, was that the culture around the team where everybody was just really close like that? Or was it just, you know, do you think maybe they kind of embrace you because they knew, you know, this is a, this young guy coming in this situation. He's not really familiar. Let's kind of help him out. What was it about, you know, that team and those guys in particular that kind of has imprinted with you in terms of the relationship you have with, with all those guys? Well, the Americans on that team were real close. We was all close with each other and um, hung out a lot when we was out there. So yeah, we we got we obviously got close just being out there hanging out all the time. And before I got there, I was familiar with with uh, um, with George Lloyd, Billy Barron, George Mickey, and, and uh, Alice Porthers, and Shabazz Napier. Obviously, I was familiar with all of them, so I was excited to uh, to go be able to play with them. And getting there. Um, quickly started hanging out with him like it was nothing. Like I had been to him almost. It kind of was just like, you know, what's up? They introduced themselves and um, I don't want to say starstruck, but it's almost, it's weird almost that I was, I used to watch some of these guys. Like I remember being in high school watching Shabazz Napier in the, in the national championship mm -hmm. and, and I was Porthers at Kentucky and stuff like that. And getting a chance to play with him and stuff, I, that was that was really cool for real. Just getting getting a chance to play with him. And I was I was excited about that, just as well as excited about playing Euroleague. Like, yeah, these are my new teammates. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I was really excited about that. And I speak highly of them, probably just being around them, seeing how professional they were, and and um, how they built up good habits over these years, just to 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 be able to play at, at the highest level for real. You know what I'm saying? You know, I I I always say like, you know. Obviously, the basketball stuff is fun, but like the the most fun, I think, especially with like you know with like this team this year, like I feel like some of the most fun times we had would just be like on the road or in the locker, room, yeah. just hanging out, talking shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, those are the memories. Those are like the 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 most organic. Yeah, kind of like, you know, that's yeah. Part that's the best part. That's the best part. I always. I always reminisce about about former teammates and stuff like that. Like even at Larvio, I I met great teammates all years that um all these first three years that I've been playing overseas. Like I got teammates from from Larvio that I talk to all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And because you know after playing places, you know the the connection kind of fades away a, a lot of times with time and and distance. Obviously, you move on to different paths and different careers, but um. Yeah, I'm still I'm still tight with a lot of my teammates from from Labrio as well as in it, for real. And like you said, just when you're in a foreign country, your American teammates usually are the guys that's more comfortable. You're more comfortable around them because they they come from where you come from. You know what I'm saying? So we all over here fighting the same struggles and battles, being American players playing playing in Europe. Yeah. So you know your your. Second year out, yeah. contract and then bought out. You're now in Euroleague, uh, finding your way. You know what I'm saying within this new system. A uh, team is still doing well in a in a position to you know punch a, a playoff spot for Euroleague. Uh, doing well in the VTB as well. Uh, and then the war happens. Uh, and then you know obviously everything kind of gets shut down, right? Uh, you know the teams are. The Russian team stopped playing all international competitions. So Euro League, Euro Cup, Champions League, all Russian teams uh, stopped playing that. Um, did they 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 suspended the the VTB for a while? Um, talk about what that first call or that first team meeting was like. Because obviously it had to be a team. 
what was that first initial kind of reaction like when you know when you get you're i'm sure you're seeing everything on the news and then it's a reality like a cheat the war is here and it's happening what was that like for you being an american in this foreign country um and not just any random foreign country right in russia well pretty powerhouse country what was what was that kind of like we we saw it coming like probably about a week in advance you know there was a lot of talks about russia and ukraine and all this and that um building up to it and um like my mom my agent us as teammates we were all talking about it just saying like man i hope it doesn't happen and we don't know what we would do if it happened we wouldn't know what would go on and um it was the day before we were supposed to play barcelona at home and I remember one of my teammates was talking to one of the guys from Barca and was saying how they didn't make the trip. They didn't travel. They didn't leave like they were supposed to because the war had started on that day. And um, us as Americans, we were just sitting in the locker room and we were um, talking about how we, we had to get our money out before um, before the war hit because everybody knew that they was going to hit the banks first. They was going to sanction the banks and... It wasn't gonna be no way to transfer money, so we all um, we all had to had to try to get that money yeah, out. That's in that bread, home. Had to get that money out. <laughs> had to get that money out. We was we was definitely stressing about that. And um, the next day, well, no, that night, that night, I was on Twitter and got an alert that said um, all all U.S. citizens should leave Russia. That's what someone um, that came from the American Embassy, U.S. Embassy. So we all texting the group message it's like at midnight and talking about like what we, we gonna, gonna do. do right <laughs> like what we gonna do so I packed my stuff up right then and there at, at midnight I think it took me like four hours to pack everything up and I had everything ready so I woke up that next morning we were supposed to have practice but it turned into a team meeting and we we're talking about what we were gonna do and coach was fine with with, with everybody going home yeah. and, and leaving and that's what we did. We lived right out of there the yeah. next day, and it was just crazy how fast it happened. Like the day before, we preparing for a game against Barcelona. We had a, you know, a day before a game type of practice. Mm -hmm. Watch film, get I'm prepared, about to say, scouting. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And and just from leaving practice after that that afternoon to the next morning being out of there, mm -hmm. it was it, it yeah, was crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. Right. The next morning, out of there, gone. Yeah. But I mean, you know, at that point, it's like you know, we gotta. Basketball is the last thing on people's yeah, yeah. mind. We got yeah. we got to get home. Yeah, it's, it's gotta, about it's about safety. Yeah, safety for sure. Making it back for your family. And my oh, mom was a nervous wreck mm -hmm. around this time. I can imagine. Yeah, she was a nervous wreck around this time because she was already kind of uneasy and skeptical about me going there in the first place. Two months later, the war hit. So it was that's that was crazy. And um, but yeah, ended up getting ten ten days at the crib. You know, in the midst of the war, before deciding to go back. And so now you do the. Uh, now you go back home, you know, for a little bit, spend some time with the family, but then you make the decision to to go back out. And and once you know, once they said, okay, we're we're still not continuing with Euro League, but you no, know, we still had the VTB. Uh, we still had the VTB league to go. Um, so we would like for everybody to come back, and you know, if I'm not mistaken, all the yeah, 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 all the Americans. Was that a was that was that a a conscious decision that everybody was gonna come back, or was it just like to each his own? Oh. Did did y'all and why I asked that? Did y'all as players maybe have a a group chat that said something like, "Y'all let's let's come back and try to do this"? Yeah. They, you know, if you come back, cool. If you don't, we understand that. If, well, let me rephrase the Shabazz didn't come back after, but um, but everyone else did, and we was all talking in a group. Um, and we all kind of made a decision, like we talking with the team and we thinking about coming back and they set a date for us to come back and everything like that. And um, yeah, that's what we ended up doing. And at first, you know, I had got those couple of days at home and I got comfortable at home, you know, you know, I, you know me, just playing with me, I always want to go home, you know, I always be thinking about home. So just being there, I was I was cool and, and then thinking about going back and having to tell my mom, like, yeah, we're gonna have to go back and finish the season in the midst of a war. What was that like? What was, what that, was, that, was, what was that conversation she was, like? She was she did not want me to <laughs> leave. I at know all. she wasn't having she that. Didn't. 
she had to she had to talk with my agent and and everybody like she had to feel comfortable about about me going back for real but um we ended up deciding that it was a safe place to be at um when nothing the actual war was going on in Ukraine when nothing actually going on nothing has took place in Russia so we we feel comfortable that we could go there and finish the last couple months out of the season. Not only did you finish the season out, but you went back, won the VTB, um, beat Cheska. Uh, was this? I'm not. Was this the first time Zena has won? Was that the first time? Yeah, won yeah. VTB? First time they won VTB. First time they won VTB or VTB. Beat Cheska in at Game Seven at Cheska, which is for those that know is unheard of. Um, what was what was that? series like because I remember watching it I'm like man didn't I have like a triple overtime game one or quadruple and I'm just looking like okay this is high level basketball right now and it's it's funny because you know it, when you say guys go home for 10 days and then come back you know that a lot of rust can happen like you said dudes get comfortable you know they might not work out they might think the season's done and then you know obviously at the drop of a dime y'all have to come back and kind of lock back in right to stay or y'all, for y'all to come back and lock back in and, you know, win some, I'm sure, in some tough environment yeah. to end up coming away with that championship. What was that like? Yeah, like you said, um, being, at, being at home, just getting comfortable and just having to having to go back and, and flip that switch, you know, get back into to, um, season mode, end of the season mode, you know. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a challenge for, it was a challenge for sure with, um, uh, with just being back out there trying to finish the season, knowing we wasn't playing Euro League, so it was one game a week basically playing VTB. Yo, it was tough, but we we hung out a lot, kind of making it making it more easier and making the time go by faster. But yeah, it was. I don't even know how to explain it. We was just we was just getting in there practicing and just trying to trying to stay locked in as we could, just trying to stay as locked in as we could. And, um, we had to play against Onyx before we played Cheska in the finals, which was also a tough series for real. But um, when it got to the playoff time, though, we was like, yeah, we got to we gotta take care of business. We got to lock in for real. Since we out here. Like, yeah, since we out here. That's, that's all we were saying. Like, we didn't come back out here just to be out here and not and not win it up. Sure. Nah, that's, and I'm sure that goes back to, you know, these relationships that you have with your teammates, right? When you go through battles like that and you come out on top. Like that just kind of makes everything. Smooth. Yeah, yeah. That's why. That's probably why I speak so highly of my teammates. As in it, well, the 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 Russian te- my Russian teammates and also the Americans, just because of what we was able to accomplish. And you know, when you go when you go through tough times with other people, that makes you closer, for real. And um, overcoming those things to to win something special, like you said, playing Cheska down three one. That's even more adversity. But um, but we was able to win. Game five, game six, game seven, and win the series. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, yeah that's definitely tough. So, uh, fresh off a of championship, now uh, we're getting into more recent times. Um, this this past, almost going on a year now, uh, this past fall in August, you signed with Unicaja, ended up here in south of Spain, Malaga. Um, what was that? What was that uh, conversation like? Because you were one of the last players to sign. So, was it, you know, Weighed, weighed the options, all the best one. Was it, um, you know, you, you saw maybe the roster uh, that guys put together. Maybe it was a talk with, with Coach Ball that kind of put it all in place for you. What was what were kind of some of the some of the factors that made you want to decide from up? Um, well, when I was at Lavrio, we played against Unicaja in Champions League. And I remember when we came here, it was one of the, one of the most beautiful places I had ever seen. I was like, why they? There's actually teams here that 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 live places like this. Like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was it was you know I was saying places that look this nice over here that teams play in. And that's one thing I like about Champions League, just traveling through different parts and you can kind of open your eyes to some 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 new things for real and new cities. And um, I remember how much, how beautiful it was then and during the summer. Um, Coach Ebar texted me, and I remember I went to Malaga before. And I got an opportunity to play there. That's that's big. Mm-hmm. I remember, and I I showed my mom, um, showed my mom where where Malaga was at, and she looked up some pictures, and 
that's all she talked about was how beautiful it was. So it became exciting real quick. Yeah. And and then uh, looking at the roster, like you said, like what five or six players were Euro League last year. That that just let me know that we were gonna be a good team. I was gonna be around some good players, and just seeing that roster, I just I knew we could we could do something special. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so come out for preseason. And it's not a typical preseason, right? You know, um, we got guys away. Alberto and Dario are with uh, Spain for the national team in Eurobasket. I'm with Montenegro for Eurobasket. Melvin is with uh, Canada. So we didn't really have our full team until, you know, probably the middle of September. Um, what were those first kind of impressions like? Because, um, you know, we had conversations at the beginning of our, you know, of our friendship and our relationship where, you know, you were playing the one, but you weren't, that's not that's not your natural position so you weren't fully comfortable um but you know you had to because you know I was gone Alberto was gone we didn't have a point guard at the time um what were kind of some of those first practices and just kind of trying to uh play with play with guys and find that chemistry early what was what was that like um well you know preseason preseason can be a struggle you know with um with the practices and trying to get in shape kind of get in uh you know season form so yeah, that was tough, especially since I was uh, having to play point guard, and I didn't, I wasn't really familiar with with the guys like that. wasn't in the best of shape, so um, it was definitely some complaints early on. But I never really had much doubts because we didn't have a full team, so I didn't have many doubts with our team. I knew that I knew we had a lot of talent, and once everybody got together, I knew I knew it was gonna be all right. We're gonna be fine. Well, we were just fine, and then and then some. Uh, you no, know, we fast forward to February. Now we're at uh, the Copa del Rey, probably one of the one of, if not the uh, most competitive uh, domestic cup tournament in in all of Europe. Um, probably one of the the biggest stages in terms of domestic leagues in Europe, and lo and behold, that 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 third game against Tenerife. Um, you and Tyler came through in the clutch for us, hitting some big shots, and we were able to, you know, come away with the trophy. But not just that, you were named the Copa del Rey MVP. Um, what was what was that like when you first heard that? Because if I'm not mistaken, you was cutting down the net uh, at the time when they was announcing it. So we like, man, get off that man's shoulders, come down. You got to get this trophy. What was what was uh what was that like when you when you kind of you know you you see the confetti's falling, you hear the crowd, you see the crowd cheering and everything. And then all you hear is Tyson Carter MVP. You know what was what was it? What was that like for for you? Um, like you said, I was cutting down the nets, and um, I didn't hear what was being said because they were speaking Spanish, and I didn't know that they was presenting no no individual awards or nothing like that. I was trying to cut the nets down, so that's the one thing that we did at, at Zen. We cut the nets down and and uh, hung up. Yeah, so I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that, so I was I was anxious about cutting the nets down. And just hearing my name with the MVP and going to uh, going to accept the trophy and everything, it was it was crazy to think about with with you know before Copa del Rey we lost two games in a row, right? And then seeing that we were matched up with Barca and Madrid on the same side it was kind of like yeah, you know, you kind of go into it, you confident always, but it's like you we know, got a shit hand, yeah, yeah, yeah we got we got we got dealt yeah, some shitty cards, yeah, you know? so. So I didn't know what to expect, and I didn't think we were just playing that good at the time. So I just didn't know what to expect. And after just beating Barca and Madrid and then beating Tenerife that last game, which you you know personally I wasn't in the best experience at the time. I wasn't really just playing that well at the time. And and so just with, with it happening like that and the way it turned for me to just get the MVP like that, it was crazy. Right. Yeah, it was crazy for sure. What was that FaceTime call like, Naman Dukes? When you back home and yeah. you know, she knows you won the championship, but now it's like, nah, man, I got the I got a little extra hardware. Yeah. With you. What was that? They like? was they was happy about that. They was real happy about that. Cause I think they they weren't able to catch the game because of uh the time difference. I don't think they were able to catch the game, but they was really excited. They was almost more excited than I was about right. about it. But um more so just crazy that how we won it won it, you know, how we beat Barcelona and Madrid and then Tenerife, which were all teams that were ahead of us in the standings, was was just crazy. Yeah. Um. So, 
uh, now talking a little bit off the court, um, you know, of course, talking about the, the Copa del Rey um, MVP, you know, that's that's a huge accomplishment. Uh, maybe, maybe one could say, you know, maybe the biggest of your career thus far, individually, individually. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, when we always talk about the thing we're most proud of is being able to show our loved ones these experiences, right? Bring them out and show them different things and um, bring them into our world a little bit and not just, you know, having it be all on FaceTime. Um, and you just recently got that opportunity with your family, being able to, to bring your mother out, your sister, your two daughters, um, bringing them out to out here to Malaga and just having them um, experience, you know, Carpena, first of all, the fans, the energy they bring. Um, but, you know, the, the city, uh, the restaurants that we like, um, just everything. What was what was that like? What was that like for you as a as a son, as a brother and as a father? Um, getting a chance to do that was the biggest accomplishment individually that I've had for sure um, in my career and in, in playing this game. Just being able to 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 have the opportunity to to bring my family out here, you know, my two daughters, my mom, and my sister, um, who never been to Spain, never right. really yeah. been out of, never been to Europe, period, and and um, they have they weren't able to watch me play in person since college, and for bringing them over here to just just show them something different, you know, show them show them the the beautiful city of Malaga, and being able to travel to Marbella and show them. Just the beach and palm trees, it's, the mountains is just totally different, you right. know, with, with what we're used to. And that made the world to me for real, for them to come out here and see that. Thanks. That it made was, the world to me for real. We, we, you know, and I've told you this before, you know, um, you know, your, your two girls, man, they got, they're going to have a, a totally different perspective on life now. And whether, and they, of course, they don't know it, you know, now being, you know, five, six years old, but just what you were able to give them is something that's gonna set them so much further ahead in life for the for the long run, for the better, and they don't even know yet. So uh, I'm I'm happy that you were I'm really Yeah. Show them that. Yeah, they always tell people back home how they wanna to go to Malaga, Spain. Mm -hmm. They they wanna go back to Malaga, Spain and all that. So that yeah, that was that was cool. Yeah, got to yeah. A couple minutes left, uh running down the stretch here. Got some quick hitters for you. Uh favorite country you visited. Favorite country that I've visited? It'll probably be Spain. Yeah, it'll probably be Spain. Uh, bucket list country or city, somewhere you've always wanted to go to? Um, I want to go to the Swiss Alps, the, the mountains up there. I think I, that's that. I'd be, I'd be looking at that sometimes and just saying that'll be a, a dope place to visit. Yeah. Uh, three artists on your current playlist. Three artists on my current playlist is. Um, Money bag, PZ is on there, and uh, that Larry Jones on there. That Larry Jones on there. <laughs> uh, the best advice you can give a player living or you know just playing overseas. Um, with living and playing. Yeah. My best advice would be um, try to get comfortable and acclimated, and just try to get as comfortable as you can and making that place your own off the court, which means like go out and meet some people, uh, walk around, you know, just walk around the center of whatever city that you are in. Just introduce yourself to people. You know, I had to learn that as I go. You know, you always talk to me about that, but uh, former teammates can talk to me about it as well. Just introduce yourself to people and, and that'll make the time go, go, go by faster the more you enjoy the off the court. And on the court, just control what you control. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times we be over here homesick and thinking about the career, but when it comes to basketball, I feel like you gotta put your all into that because that's what you're here for. We're not we not over here just for nothing. We over here to play ball. So try to control what you control, but put a lot into it though. Last one. Uh someone whose story needs to be heard on this podcast. But I'm gonna I'm a bite, I'm gonna take from all the smoke right now. You have to help me get them on here, and they can't be teammates. They can't be our teammates because okay, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's too yeah. easy. I'm not letting I'm not letting you off the hook on that. Okay. One. I would say Alpha Diallo and Jordan Lloyd. 
I was in there. Yeah. Y'all heard it here first. Alpha, yeah. J. Lloyd. We gonna we gonna set it up. I know yeah, they got some nice stories. I know I know Jay Lloyd a little preoccupied right now, man. Congrats on the on the on the blessing. Um, but we'll we'll map it out sometime soon. But uh, Tyson, before we get out of here, bro, tell tell the people where you can where they can find you on on Instagram or Twitter. Oh yeah, on Instagram, uh, the Tyson Carter on Instagram. Um, that's which app I use the most. Where you can go follow my Twitter twenty was Tyson twenty three Carter or something on Twitter, but. I usually use Instagram for the most part. All right, well, uh, that's a wrap for us, man. Uh, my dog, appreciate you pulling up on me, it. man. Appreciate you locking in. Gotcha. Uh, it's been another episode of Life Across the Water. Check us out on all uh, all platforms where podcasts are available. Um, go ahead and get yourself some Shop KP3 gear while you at it, shopkp3.com. And um, you know, until next time, stay certified in person. KP3 out.